Welcome to Testing Experts with Opinions, an inspired testing podcast aimed at creating conversations about trends, tools, and technology in the software testing space. And we're live again. Everyone well? Hey, Good, Leon. Thank you. you. Uh, well, thanks. It's it's actually so weird for me to ask whether you're well, because, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure everyone knows that we're having discussions throughout the day, and it's not the first time <laughs> that we really I'll, I'll keep I'll keep it that way and just be polite. Okay, so an idea we had was to look through a, I guess, a bit of a diagram or infographic that we have internally, and it's around the role of QA within a, I'm going to say a typical Scrum team, because we know that Scrum teams are also sometimes very different depending on, on which organization you're in. A certain organizations do Agile a lot more or better compared to others. I don't want to say better, differently. They do Agile differently. And the role within an Agile team, and specifically Scrum, which we'll look at today, it also very much differs depending on which organization you're in. So Stefan will actually go ahead and share something which we'll talk through and, and we'll debate it a little bit. I think it's it's not, this is not cast in stone. It's, it's not something that needs to be followed to the T, but it's kind of our stab at something that should work for most organizations, maybe something which is fairly generic and, and fairly easy to apply in terms of, of the the QA role within an organization, how that plugs into Scrum. So I think, Stefan, if you can go ahead and, and, and start sharing, then we can take a look. Thanks, Leon. Do you just want to start by maybe just walking us through it? And then as you go through, we can maybe just, if, if anyone wants to to mention anything, give their opinions, challenge anything on you, et cetera, then we'll, we'll just do that. For sure. So I, I think just, from from a bird's eye view, if we just look at the the top layers, we try to visualize it as saying, for any any agile project, there's usually a start of a project phase, and then obviously when the when the project starts, we go sprint by sprint, each each sprint having pre sprint activities, in sprint activities, and then post sprint activities, and once the actual project has been delivered. Well, that's all. It could be end of sprint or end of project. If it's only end of sprint, we just run back to pre-sprint activities. So just to give that sort of bird's eye view. So what this diagram tries to show is as part of each of these steps or phases in a agile or in a project that uses the agile methodology, just to sort of give an idea or guidance to as to what the QA team's responsibility should be. So I guess let's let's jump into it. So right at the start of a project, one of the first steps should be to, well, as a team, define the initial product backlog. And, you know, that typically is based on something like a documentation, like a BRS and an FRS, those kind of documentations. But from a testing point of view, that's typically the stage where a, where a test plan is created. So I know there's a lot of the time there's debate, like, is a test plan really still needed? I would definitely say yes, maybe to some degree, some companies like a more detailed test plan than others, but nevertheless, definitely a, a test plan. I mean, we were just, I was just busy with a, uh, talking to a client this morning, and I think sometimes people don't realize if you properly write a test plan, you are actually busy doing static testing of the documentation because of you writing a proper test plan and you, you are, you know, you need that clarity in terms of what the scope of the system is, how that integrates with other pieces of other systems within the organization because if you don't have that view and if that diagrams and architecture isn't available you know then your test plan is going to be very vague so you are actually really deep diving into a lot of documentation uh, trying to understand the different non-functional requirements and functional requirements and because because that needs to be stipulated in your test plan so i think this is a very important step and people overlook the static testing aspect to it i think that's very important do you want to oh, talk to that? You go. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Sorry. Well, I just want to talk about this a little bit, Stefan, because it's it's a concept I struggle with and get a lot of questions about. Is this test plan? Now, there, there are two test plans. You're talking about a start of project test plan, and maybe the word test plan I struggle with a little bit. Mm -hmm. So maybe how do we? want to test the project from a strategy perspective or from a approach perspective 
And then a lot of clients ask for, before we start the sprint, what is your test plan as well? So if, you, if you're talking about great test plan here, yeah, which specific one are you referring to? That's a good question. I made an assumption then that's dangerous. I know some companies talk, talk about a test plan. They actually refer to the test cases. In this case, definitely it's the strategic plan. It's the overall approach to how you're going to handle testing. It talks about what's in scope, what will you be focusing on, what is out of scope. What are those test items? Like I mentioned, if I don't have an architectural diagram of where this piece of new system or functionality fits into the bigger picture, I don't know what to test. I don't know what integration to test. I don't know the scope of my integration to test. You know, there's a lot of components. You need to understand what are the functional requirements? What are the non-functional? Do, I, do we care about performance? Do we care about security? Mm. Who's responsible for what? Timelines? Sometimes, I mean, my personal opinion is not to include timelines specifically in a test plan. I would rather have a link to the overall project plan, and then they should those testing activities should slot into the central test project plan, or in terms of milestones and deliverable timelines. But, but it that to answer your question in short, it's definitely the strategic document, not the test plans in terms of test cases. Yeah, then then I like it because. Uh, I think that word test plan sometimes confuses us. And as soon as we start talking about test plans, we want resources and timelines and things. I think what, what you're positioning here is the right one. So if you're looking at this piece of work, looking at the integrations, in, inter-system and, and external system integrations, what is your approach and what mm. kind of testing would you would you recommend we do just to mm. start planning? And, and, and I agree, they the... The architectural diagrams play a big role, but it's not to, we're going to taste this feature here. Stefan's going to taste this, going to be tested in sprint three. It's, it's not that no, kind no, of thing no. or high level. Thanks. That make, I agree with that. Stephen? And, and yeah, I, I think a lot of the time people, people, people make the mistake of a test plan being a burden. It's just a document or artifact that you write once off just to get it out of the way as a, as part of your quality gate. And then, then they forget about it and then maybe pick about, pick it up again when you submit it at the end of your project. Or to me, when I when I talk to test analysts and say write a test plan, they should see it as a practical document. I'd rather have a test plan that's ten li- that are ten lines long and you keep it in your back pocket and you refer to it every day rather than a fifty pager and you never look at it again. So yeah. it always needs to be practical. It's not about the length, it's about can you practically apply that strategy in a project. If it's just a fluffy theoretical thing, nobody's going to bother about it or look at it again. So I think that to me is the important bit about this step. I, I was just going to add, is the pushback from the client, because I've, I've had it with clients where the pushback on something like that would be, Agile doesn't advocate lots of process and lots of documentation. So like I, I like to refer to them as purists. It's like they, they refer to Scrum Guard as like gospel and <laughs> it, it, you shouldn't deviate from it. And I would always challenge them with, it's not what it says. It just says no pointless or frivolous, unnecessary documentation for the sake of it. Like a one-page approach or a couple of page approaches of, of how you plan to tackle testing for the team for every sprint they run is a really valid mm-hmm. artifact to have and is really valuable. It's not going to slow the sprint down. If anything, it should speed it up because you're not going to get questions from, for example, people new to the team. Well, what do we do around performance? Well, our approach to performance testing is in this in the test plan or approach document mm. or our, our confluence page or wherever it is you store that. Yeah, and yes. that makes sense because because I think again to be able to point the, the test plan thing when we grew up a test plan was a 20, 30 page document, as Stefan has said. And an artifact saying what do we want to test? Kind of what which testing types, how do we want to tackle it? If we do performance, do you do you do it in sprint? Are we going to leave that? So those kind of things are extremely valuable. And and this mm. artifact Stefan, you said it should be a, a short thing that really just guides us rather than this historic test plan that feeds in, into a pro that goes into a strategy sitting with 90-page documents. So then I absolutely agree. Sorry, Leon. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think you can very easily replace the word test plan, not replace. And alternative words could be test strategy, test approach, test plan. Companies will refer to it as different things. But what's important is that activity drives conversation. And that, for me, is the massive benefit of, of having that. It's, it's going to make people, it's going to force people to think about a project and what's required for a project. What are all the mm. considerations? Have we thought about this? Have we thought about that? So I completely agree. It should, it should not be a tick, back, tick box activity. 
and it should be something which is a living document. So it, let's 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 argue that this is this is an approach for how we're going to test this this project. I don't think that's something that you do and you complete. It's it's something that you're going to continuously work on. It needs to be a an organically growing document as you're going through the project. You're making changes and maybe you're adapting it, etc. But again, it's good because it drives conversation. And as you're having more conversations, your your test test plan, test approach, test strategy, whatever you want to refer to it as, it actually adapts with you. Yeah, and and, and it should because. If you look at that start of the project, it's initial product backlog. We're only getting to the nitty gritty detail in grooming, but more, mostly sprint planning, where you really understand integrations, for example. You really understand is the accessibility here, is the performance here, is the functionality here. And then when you get there, you can refer back and update that according to the new decisions. And, and I like that. Yeah. But I, I just want to reiterate what I can't remember whether it was Jan or Stefan that said it, but. I'm not a subscriber of this being a 20, 30, 40, 50 page document anymore. Totally, yeah. It's a, it's a couple of pages maximum because we know in the, in the past how difficult it is to firstly get people to read a document of that length. Let, let's be honest. Everyone outside of testing doesn't really care about testing that much or they don't have a massive interest. They don't do not want to go and read a 50 page document about testing and how we're going to approach it. So you need to keep it light for your audience, but it needs to have the 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 pertinent information in there where you're getting your your point across. Everyone knows what you're planning. Everyone's on the same page, and like I said, it's it's driving the conversation. So, I definitely think there's still value in doing it, but be pragmatic in terms of the length and what's what's what what actually goes into it. Mm. Kind, Leona, of bring, kind of bring me to my second question. Sorry, Stefan. Mm. I'll ask after you finished your thought. Yeah. Thanks, Jan. I'll be quick. Now, just sometimes the devil is in the detail. Sometimes the test plan shouldn't be too light. Like I, I always talk about reporting. What what it will be in those reports when when we when stakeholders ask us two three months down the line for report? If we agree, for example, so, sometimes we need to go into a little bit of detail depending on the section of a test plan or test strategy. Because if you if you know, for, let's for, so for, let's say for example, three months down the line, somebody asks you. Tell me, I want to see for each user story, what's your test coverage and clearance on that. If you didn't know that was a requirement, you probably wouldn't have necessarily made the point of linking each test case to a specific user story and then link it also to the requirement, which is for that user story. If you don't do that metadata linking up front, you're going to be scrambling around three months trying to backdate your test cases. So certain things you have to be very pedantic about agreeing with your stakeholders say these are the things you said you wanted to see i've prepped for this i've got the metadata mm. but for these new reports yes i can do it but it's probably going to take me some time and just to cover yourself so some sections high but sometimes you need to think a little bit into the future and and cover yourself so anyway that was just a side note that's more from mm. you know it might, may be different per client but it's just sort of a be aware of going too light too far to the other side as well yep. yeah yeah yeah, and yeah, and I, I think it's very much it's it's horses for courses. It's being pragmatic. So if you're in an organization where there's a lot of rigor, there's a lot of compliance, there's a lot of you will know there's a lot of red tape typically in your day to day. You're probably going to angle more towards having a much longer, more more detailed one. But if it's a if it's a a, a much more agile environment. Maybe small organizations or, or or not necessarily small organizations, but just organizations which embrace agile more then 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 maybe it's slightly shorter and, and there's not as much detail in there so again I, I think it's just about being pragmatic and and agreeing what the plan is in terms of that pragmatism so this is what we're going to produce does that does that work for everyone yes okay let's go for it mm. so I quite like a wiki format for that or like a sub page format so you could like you said Stefan that maybe say say defect management we need to be really clear and concise on that so you could just have a breakout page or a sub page or a sub thread that would mm. go into that more detail because not everyone cares about that but let's say your cab approval process they need to see what your defect management is so that needs to be in a bit more detail and doing like a wiki page or sub threads is another way of just making it easy to navigate and so people can just skim read or read the bits that are pertinent to them mm-hmm 
good point. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to get us to move on. Otherwise, we're going to be here for four hours, and I'm sure no one's going to watch yeah. that long. Uh, I do yeah. want to uh, ask the second question. I know you'll move on. So we'll move on from that one. Should we then have a plan per sprint? Because that, that's the, the contentious part if I speak to clients. It's okay, I get that. I get the first one, and I think most of you. But should you also then have a test plan per sprint? I would I would say if you're part of like a release train, the purpose of the team changes. So let's say you're an API team, right? And then you are then moved to back end after like a year. Like, yeah, you should change it. Or if the if there's like a really narrow or specific scope for like the next four sprints, we're gonna be doing this block of work. And then the next four months of the year, we're doing a different block that's unrelated. That's when I would look at updating it. But I wouldn't do it sprint to sprint. Oh, I've, I've, I've rarely seen that in, in, in reality. Agreed. I, th- I think it's very much project-based. So as long as, you still st- as, long as your, your sprints are still working towards delivering that project, there's no need for a test plan. But as soon as you, you're tackling a new project or, or maybe – like Steve mentioned, you're moving away into a different area, then I think there's there's a need for that again. Hmm. Well, Leon, should we move on to the next one? Yes, sir. Okay, so talking about product backlog grooming, and that's an ongoing thing, right? But whenever we do product backlog grooming, we should always think about the three amigos exercise where BAs, devs, and testers are, are all put together in, in, in these meetings to, to break down these user stories and Q, the QA team should always be involved when the acceptance criteria is defined and I think mostly yes to ask like have you thought about this or that but I think to me it's always important is that acceptance criteria testable? We need to make sure it's practical that we can actually tell you yes this is actually meeting the criteria or not that's super identif- important and I think often teams make the mistake of when they're sizing stories, they only size the development component of that story mm-hmm. and not always the testing component. And it's sometimes difficult to combine everything together. I've worked in teams where they would have a parent story, but then they would size the subtasks. They would size the dev subtask and the test subtask together and then almost get a feel for it and to just understand that the, the differences in complex, complexity. Because sometimes you can make a small dev in, a change but it has a massive testing impact right so we need to consider that and then also i think in in terms of the product backlog grooming always ensure that the definition of ready and the definition of done has the necessary qa elements these are typically things that are generic across all user stories other than when we talk about acceptance criteria that's specific per user story but when we talk when i say ensure definition of ready and definition of done has the necessary qa elements when we talk about these things, that some some examples of the definition of ready is is the user story well written and easy to understand, so that you have context. Does it, like I mentioned, does it have clear and testable acceptance criteria? Does you know all the external and internal dependencies identified and noted? These kind of things are important. Is the testing you know is the testing effort clearly estimated as part of your definition of ready? And also, is the story prioritized? So that's also part of your definition of ready. So that if you have 20 user stories to test in a sprint, which ones do you pick up first? So it may, these definition of ready and definition of done elements might be different per, per team, but it's in, I think it's important to, to define this so that there's clarity. In terms of definition of done, it could be things like, has as a unit test been written and passed? Has functional and non-functional testing passed? And... Are there any critical bugs or there are no critical bugs before you can actually pass a user story in, at the end of the sprint? So I'm not sure what your what your experience are, experiences are in terms of these definition of ready and definition of done or some of the other elements. Your thoughts? That's an interesting one, Stefan. The, the way you, you explain it now is more, is the, I suppose, the theoretical version. But I've seen increasingly so a lot of, Client saying that testing is not part of the definition of done. So they have a de- definition of development done, and then those things move to a testing backlog, which will then have their own definition of testing done because for, for various reasons, and, I, and I've tried to debate it, but for, for various reasons, we, we're developing now, we don't want to deploy now, we don't want to test now, testing have, uh, will have their own priorities and things like that. But w- what is just for the, the room, what is your view on that? So they have a 
development done, which they say is, is the definition of done, and then testing will have their own definition of done somewhere else. I, I personally don't like that because that's us and them. Hmm. And it breaks the team coherency. It's one team with one combined goal as opposed to we're waiting on QA or we're throwing it over the fence and it's in their back lockdown. It, it creates a, a, a nice clean waterfall cycle within the sprint which kind of defeats the whole purpose of it being a, a, a collaborative of participation of all members, is what I would say. They, they kind of take it one step further. So the the testing sprint for the work that was developed in sprint one may, may only be in sprint seven. So they don't even make the definition of done for that sprint, testing and development. So they do test plan analysis and design in the sprint that the dev happens, but the test execution will happen four, six, seven, how, how many sprints later, um, which is quite an interesting one. It yeah, makes it a nightmare sure. when you find defects, not of course. But yeah, Should yeah. that story have been pulled into the sprint in the first place then? That's what I was going to ask, yeah. The, th- the thing for me is w- one of the principles of Agile is to be able to release something after every sprint. So is in it theory, done, you should, done, done. You yeah, should done, have done. been able to deploy yeah. something. Now, for me, that's just creating technical debt. and it's it's adding so many issues in terms of really being able to measure your sprint velocity it's it's definitely going to it's definitely go, it's moving away from agile right so the whole idea of agile being able to deploy after every sprint in theory i know a lot of a lot of companies don't do that a lot of teams don't do that but it's the whole co- collaboration thing and it's it's getting everyone to collectively accept responsibility for quality as well now it's again driving a wedge between the develop development function and the testing function and it was actually one of the things that i wanted to mention when when stefan went through this on the on the second in the second swim lane in that yes we're referring to a qa team but actually it's it's a it's a quality function it could be developers or testers doing yeah. those activities. It doesn't have to be someone that's designated a tester. But Jan, in that example where you're having development done now and in in seven sprints time you're doing the testing, it feels more like waterfall than it does agile. But yeah. it, it's almost a it's almost it's almost a an even a prolonged version of, of waterfall and I, I would then say get the testers to work in a completely different team on their own and w- and move back to what worked in the old days because yeah. now you're sort of stuck in between two worlds and I, I just uh, I can probably debate this for the next two hours. It just doesn't make sense to me. Well, the, the, the point of the sprint, isn't it? The sprint of Agile, it's just a deming cycle, right? So the point is you release fast and often to get feedback fast and often so you can mm. course correct on that feedback. The testing is part of that feedback cycle. So the longer you wait for the feedback to come, the mm-hmm. worse it is. The, so like this, I'm just thinking like practically, the, the, the testers found something, they find a defect, and the devs are like, yeah, we we wrote that code four weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, exactly. Now, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So like, surely that's going to slow the mechanism down, right? Yeah. Plus they've got now new sprint deliverables to focus yeah, exactly. on. That. And the first of yeah. that now, they're going to try and just give you a quick fix, not really think it through because yeah. the pressure is on. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say that exact thing. That exact thing. This doesn't work for QA, but it doesn't work for the development function either because for that exact reason. We, we've done it. We've completed it. Now, okay. two months down the line or five weeks down the line, you're saying, oh, I now need to go back to it. I need to go and refresh myself around what I did, why I did it in a particular way, fix it, and then potentially in another week or two, you're going to let me know whether it works or not. And, uh, so, and I'm going to have to go back, uh, go away from what I'm currently doing. It's just, I would like to understand what the benefits are of that as opposed to maybe all the cons we're seeing at the moment. But it just, mm-hmm. I, I, I struggle to see the pros. I've, I've seen it, and, and I agree with, with everyone here, but I've seen it in, I want to say, 50 to 60% of the clients in the last month that I've spoken to are doing this. All right. So why are they doing this? And I and I didn't give you that context. So we we had a we had a webinar about testing and who testing should report to and the autonomy thereof. But they are saying that in a sprint testing is in the way. So the developers are saying I can't develop at the the pace or cadence that I want to because testing is in the way. 
So they move testing out of the sprint. So now developers say, well, oh, great, look at look at all the work I'm pushing through. And they're happy with the comebacks a couple of couple of sprints down the line. Because from a development perspective, and because development people are looking at the sprint, and they're hitting up the sprint more often than not, they are saying, look at our development effort, and it's going well. Testers, testers are on the way, so let's remove them, um, and let's give them a bone when they need one later down the line. And that's really where this is, and, and I agree with you, it's not the right way, but that's that's where this is coming from. But it's like I, I, like I can drive my car 100 miles, but the tires are going to fall off at 60. So I'm more bothered about like seeing the, the 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 pseudonym of progress, the fakeness of progress, when in reality, I've got all this stuff behind me that needs to be sorted out. And it, eventually, it's just going to crash into the back of there, right? It's just a strange way to think about it. And it does make it an us and them thing. It definitely makes it is QA are the problem. QA are the thing that slows it down. Instead of thinking, how can we help the testers test faster? How can we speed it up? Us as developers, what can we do? Can we automate more of our code? Can we do more unit testing? Can we pair test with them so we can create more depth in that automation pack? What can we do to speed them up as opposed to let's pull them out of the team and put them in a different cadence? That's just a strange way of going about it. And that was my approach, Stephen. I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and that's my response to that is absolutely. I get that testing seems to be in the way at the moment. But that that is because you're testing at the wrong level. If you move testing to where it should be done, i.e. left or which, whichever down the pyramid, but we move testing to the responsibility of everyone. We see what developers can do in the testing world. Then your testing load for a traditional tester is a lot less. And then we can get through the sprint. So if you move if you move the testing or quality task, as they want to say, quality task to where they should be, then there shouldn't be an issue. But it's because testing are still doing everything quality-wise, yeah. they are becoming the bottleneck. So I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Mm -hmm. I, I... Maybe it's a bit controversial, but sometimes I think people write user stories incorrectly. They would maybe write an end-to-end user story that says, oh, as, a, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as, as person A, I want to do this, but it's sort of this end-to-end -end kind of user story, and they pull it in in the beginning, and it's all the pieces aren't there, so you have to park it. People need to write small components in the user stories as small components that can be tested in isolation at that point in time in the project. And sometimes people really misuse the, the word that the way that the user story is written. And they that's why I say it needs to be testable, but testable at that point in time, not testable in 10, 10 sprints time. So and I think that's also where we as QA need to almost guide the people in the way that they write user stories and prioritize them. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, think, I, I, would, I would really like to debate that for for in in another session because i yeah. think it's very interesting and and someone said it's wrong it's not necessarily wrong <laughs> it's just different and and maybe it's not wrong maybe maybe there are merits to it so so maybe something we should discuss yeah. in future yeah i mean at the moment we we are also being a bit theoretical here in that right. this is the right blueprint, this is the right thing to do. But maybe there are merits to, to doing it. And and I think that's how testing evolves, right? To to actually look at how those companies are doing it and and taking the good parts out of it and keeping the good parts and maybe improving the parts that that, that could work better. So no, it's a it's a it's a very interesting concept. There is, of course, the and I mean, pure pure agile says you need to be it needs to be done done like testing everything done before, but in theory you could potentially say only dev is done in the first sprint and testing is done the next sprint, but then they have to have sort of say if I can work at a hundred points cadence I only need to pick up seventy five and allocate those other twenty five for bug fixes and things and maybe it's not wrong at the end of your release. Maybe allow another sprint just to realign and catch up everything. And I think teams are doing things like that. I've seen many yeah. flavors of what works for the team. I don't team. think we need to be hard yeah. and fast about it. Like you said, Leon, it needs to be practical. We're not talking about perfect world, purist kind of almost theory, but mm. people are creative in what I've seen in projects and it is like that. So we, we yeah. do the same with automation, right? Typically when it's UI automation, we always say N minus one. We don't draw finish UI automation typically in the same sprint, mm -hmm. we do it the next sprint. And that's also testing, if you think, in a way. So why is that okay? <laughs> I'm being sort of devil's advocate here, but... Yeah. You're right. Well, I think there's always going to be stuff that you're going to carry over to the next sprint. But I'm just, when I say no, I'm, I'm kind of coming with the perspective of you don't want to carry much, that technical debt, that baggage will quickly yeah. accumulate. 
yeah. and you'll have to have more and more of those like rebalancing sprints or reset sprints to yeah. clear that debt down and keep going. The part it's not just about releasing fast; it's about reducing waste and technical debt is waste material, waste activity that you've not been able to complete. So yeah. it's just a, it's something that will accumulate. That's all. Yeah, but it's only waste if you see it as waste. Yeah, and I think in those in, in that scenario, they don't actually see it as waste. They see it as a way of of, of working. Hmm. But it's, I mean, it's interesting. I was just thinking most companies we speak to, they either want to reduce the cost of testing or they want to release more frequently and faster. That example goes completely against that Mm -hmm. because you're not releasing faster. You're releasing less frequently. And I'm just thinking from the business perspective, the business will want their changes on the site as soon as possible. So you're delaying that as well. So I, I wonder how much internal pressure there is on on sort of that, that way of working in terms of actually getting into production more often. So so these ca- these clients that I'm talking about don't have the luxury, if that is a luxury, to release often. So there are big organizations working with financial institutions, for example, and they say, well, we release once every three months. We don't really care about, right? And 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 again, we said it. It's it's dependent on your organization, your operating model, where where this is. And the, the argument should be then: should you do sprint? I suppose. Yeah. Uh, should you should you do agile? That's a different conversation. But they don't have to deploy that often, and therefore they just want to get as much out from a dev perspective, and they'll they'll catch up. We, okay, we, I'm we gonna I'm gonna have to the force case, us to move on. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to move on, Stefan. Uh, yes, I think I, I don't think there's much pushback from from that third one, other than uh, sorry, which one? Second one, other than the mm-hmm. fact that yeah. I think it's a it's a QA capability as opposed to necessarily the QA team doing that or a tester with a designated hat on. But I think we could definitely go to the sprint planning phase. Let me see what we what we said here. Ensure that there is sufficient capacity in the team for QA tasks related to the upcoming sprints user stories. So once again, it's just let's, you know, how much effort is the story really going to take? It might, it might be one day of dev, but it might require a lot more time to fix to actually test the the, the code. So make sure that you understand the cadence of your team, especially in your testing side, and make sure that you're not over allocated in terms of the testing effort. And I, then- I think that's actually important because often we get stuck in our ways, right? And as an agile team or as a scrum team, we, we've come to become used to delivering X story points every sprint. And, and maybe your velocity is 20 or 30 or however you, t- you, you measure that is, is kind of irrelevant. But now you have someone who's going to be on holiday for two weeks, especially specifically in, in the within the testing capability, or maybe just in the team if everyone's doing doing testing collectively. But actually go and adjust your velocity for that following sprint when you're having holiday, as opposed to just relying on what we deliver every sprint. Because then often you see failure, and you've not actually considered the fact that well, actually we were a person down in the sprint or two people down. And and in smaller scrum teams, that has a massive impact. If if you have a, a team of three or four, then a person not being there, I mean, you're losing potentially twenty five percent capacity. So I think that first point is very is very important in that you need to ensure that there's sufficient capacity, and it comes back to the planning. For sure, I think I think anything I'd add to that is there's other QA tasks other than those associated with the user story. So prepping debt, making sure environment stable like general housekeeping around other bits and bobs is all activities that that, are, that need to happen in that sprint, not just those associated with the story itself. Exactly. And people that aren't in the testing world don't necessarily realize the effort to prep tricky or very diff- difficult combinations of test data for your testing. And that's why you need to say and say, okay, this is actually whatever, a five or an eight or whatever the the point is for that, for that effort. So, yeah. My next There's, comment is going to sound straightforward and something obvious right but that should be done by the person testing now you're going to say well of course it should be so many organizations i talk to testing will be told how long it would be depending on on the development effort right so when i'm saying that those estimations because it's not clear on the slide and and i'm saying this but size qa tasks and qa capacity that input should be should come from the testing team and not uh, being handed down because 
we, the development effort is, is 10 points and three points for testing because it's not that uh, big, right? Exactly. So it goes without saying, but I still talk to a lot of people who says, oh, wow, we didn't know that testing should really be in there and tell mm-hmm. us how long it's going to take because now it's going to, back to the previous, it's going to throw a sprint off if you want to taste for longer than we thought you should have tasted. So for, well, okay. for swim lane two and three, testing should be there and doing those estimations for themselves. Mm-hmm. A good comeback on that is testers don't tell all the devs how long it's going to take, do they? The BAs don't tell the devs that'll take you two weeks to code that. Like mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's not that's not a two way road, is it? <laughs> Everyone estimates their own work except for QA. That's I have had that experience as well. It's it's a strange one. But also, it's I've used this example in the past where oh, testing should should take twenty to thirty percent of the development effort, but. I can make a single change in a CSS file or a JavaScript file, a single line, which is going to take an immense amount of testing. In that case, you can't say, oh, that 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 one line change has taken 10 seconds and therefore we don't need to test it. Well, actually, you now need to go and potentially do testing on, on different browsers and you need to check on mobile, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, it, again, it's, it, it's about practice pragmatism and being pragmatic around things but absolutely testing should should come up with estimation they should have an equal voice in terms of how long an activity should or sorry what the size of a story should be mm. how long activity should take and if there's a testing specific activity they need to have the loudest voice in terms of how long we actually need for that because they would have thought about it much more than the developers yeah Leon, don't get me started on sizing. I, I I was at a team where we eventually said, drop these points, just put in hours. Like, this is going to take me two days, I'm putting in 16 hours. Yeah. To me, that's a much more accurate estimation. That's just me. But I don't know, sometimes it gets very fluffy. And especially if you give like a, because then you can actually really size the dev is going to take me X amount of hours, this hours. Then you can actually say, I've got X amount of hours in the week. This is sort of my estimation. Then it's like hard and fast. But maybe that's a topic for another day. What do we but think again, about sizing? I, yeah, I, I, I think it's yeah. about what works for you. What works for you as a team? And and if okay. you as a team decide we actually want to estimate in hours as opposed to story points, then why not? As long as you are getting through your work, as long as you're delivering what you said at the start of the sprint, then I don't really care how you deliver it as long as everyone is in agreement. But I think the problem comes in where one person wants to estimate in story points and another person says hours is good and no, let's go minutes, et cetera. Let's yeah, use planning t- poker. No, let's use t- T-shirt size, et cetera. Then it just go- starts going wrong. But I think if everyone can agree to a single way, then I think it's fine. Yeah, I agree. Again, pragmatism. Okay. I think I've said it about 15 times already. <laughs> I might say it another 10 times. It's like it's your catchphrase, like Stevens is it depends. It depends. <laughs> Lily. <laughs> that pending is going to be on a t shirt. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, Stefan, just quickly, sorry, I, I don't think we're going to get through everything. So I suggest maybe we do one more and then we can look at the rest in a, in a next in a next session. Otherwise, this is going to become very long, and and we know that uh, people don't have that that much time to watch podcasts. So we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that that they'll actually watch the second one. So I think maybe let's just discuss one more, and then we can uh, we can park it for okay. for today. Sure, and maybe we should just wrap up the swim line. I've still got two more th- top uh, points that may may also be more may also spark debate. Ensure definition of ready is met. So whatever you define in your definition of ready. Once again, like it's, for example, clear and testable acceptance criteria and st- or a stable test environment. I mentioned a few other examples and there's lots to read up. So that, that's quite an obvious one. I think the second one or the third one is quite important and sometimes missed. Coordinate any externally required testing. So sometimes, especially if you've got clear non-functional requirements, user stories in a sprint might require specific things like performance testing or security testing or Later down the line, UAT or OAT, somebody needs to coordinate that. Sometimes that falls between the cracks and the team testing teams thinks it's the scrum master or vice versa. I think primarily the ownership should sit with the, with the QA team to drive it and make sure somebody drives it at least. Almost like when you say racy, they could be accountable but also responsible, typically both, but maybe it's a bit of a combination between the scrum master or whoever else. But I think 
They need to play a role in, especially it's in the test plan. They should know that it should be coming up. They should keep an eye out and understand that that's a requirement. If it's security testing, for example, I've worked at companies where you need to book out the pen testing team three months in advance because they're so busy. If you know that's going to happen three months down the line, start start booking that slot, even though it's not maybe in this next few sprints. I think that's mm. I think just, sorry, on the second point, I think what's very important to realize there is where you have clear and testable acceptance criteria. Mm. This is not the time to actually start looking at whether it is clear and testable. That needs to be done yeah. during grooming stage, during backlog refinement stage. So this is just saying, oh, we have a definition of ready, and this is one of the things. But mm -hmm. you can't start doing the work when you're doing sprint planning because that's way too late. You can't now go and, and go back to say, oh, this requirement isn't clear or this is not th this isn't, is maybe not that testable. So I just want to be clear in, in terms of what that means. It means yes. ensuring that it's met. Yeah, so, this, yeah this is checklist. This, Sorry, yeah. Sorry. No, I just what I'm what I think what this means is like you say, Leon. This is a quality gate. We are checking that those tick boxes in the DOR is met. If it if it's not ticked, we cannot pull it into the sprint. We need to pick up the next one or whatever the case yeah. may be. So it's a quality gate concept. Stable mm. test environments. We might discuss that for another day. <laughs> I've that never seen a conversation life. completely completely on its own. <laughs> Uh, Leon, we've got five minutes. Would you like to jump into the next one? I'm not sure if we're going to I think, land. I think let's let's finish this one, and then next time we can discuss the the next four. Yeah, yeah. starting with a sprint. I how, how would you? I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here now. So, mm -hmm. if we put in our definition of ready, a oh. stable test environment, how would how are we defining whether it's stable before we started testing? It's available to the to the right people. I'm not going to go to detail here. The date within it allows me to complete the test that I need to do, and that any any other activities in that environment or people are aware that I'm going to be using it. So it could be ready, it could be full of data, but there's twelve of the testers using it at the same time. We all trash each other. That's the kind of three three standouts I can think of off the top of my head. Well, I, yeah, I think also if you look at the definition of ready, one of the things that I think it's important just to say all external and internal dependencies are identified for those user stories. If you can say up front, as part of me having to sign off X user story A, B, and C, I need to integrate with this, this or that API, and that's not ready, then to me, that's not a stable test environment. Yes, maybe I can create mocks and stubs and whatever I need to do, but then we need to raise it and say it's not really testing what we should be testing. So you need to understand the complexity of integration. It's not only the little bit of your application. It's almost like the systems of systems environment. And you need to understand to what point you need to test. So coming coming back to that architectural diagram all the time, if you don't understand the bigger picture and how things fit in together, you might think you have a stable environment until you start doing your actual testing. So, yeah. so I would challenge that a little bit because this is sprint planning. So I will say that you will have no code that is ready for you to test because the sprint has not started yet, right? Data will probably not be there because, again, this is sprint planning. So I'm hearing that we want code and data and stability before the sprint starts. And you'll, I don't think you'll get that because the developers are only developing the things that you want to test during the sprint. So I don't, I don't think that a stable test environment is necessarily a quality gate thing. Yes, from, from, from a, do we have an environment that we can test on? Should there be something to test? Maybe that, but I don't think you're going to get any code for that sprint before the sprint has started. Mm. It depends. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Sorry, uh, I get paid every time you say it. Yeah, it, it depends. Maybe if maybe there's an API that there's no dev involved in the API. It's just an API that's not been set up or configured yet for you to test on. I understand if there's lots of bits and pieces that still needs to be developed, that's fine. But your baseline before you start any dev, there should be some level of stability on, on that. Like, yeah, anyway, I, maybe it's a really much, a very much a depends one. But yeah, and I, I, that's a good point you're making. Obviously, if the ABIs you need to integrate still need to be developed, then you, you won't know. Everything is still up in the air. But, but, yeah. but again, Stefan, just to come back to that. So say all the APIs that you need to integrate to exist, the, where you just say that development and testing of that development happens within the sprint. So you can't realistically expect any of that to, uh, to have happened before that sprint. 
because you are testing what they are developing and what they are developing they need to deploy to that environment so that environment will not be ready with the code before you go into the sprint because again the code will be developed and tested in that sprint yes obviously from a regression testing perspective i think maybe there's an argument to be made but for any new work in this project we are only going into the sprint and i need to test it when it is available and yep. not before it is available fair enough yeah. Maybe I think it's more price. about availability of a test environment. Yeah. Sorry, mm-hmm. it's it's about making sure that during your your sprint planning phase, you know which environment you're going to be testing on. You know that you have availability to it. There's no there's no other team in that in that environment. There's there's maybe not a, a so, so let's let's go back to the other example, the one where we said oh certain teams do testing down the road. They, they do it in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Maybe that that's a separate team that's currently in that environment. Yeah. Knowing that that environment's going to be ready for you to start tomorrow when the sprint starts or later today, I think that's what that is in, mm. in terms of the definition of ready. We can, we can debate the actual stability of a test environment and what it needs, et cetera, but I, I think it's slightly different. Mm. It's a good um, point. Mm. So I think, it, I think that's good. Sorry, mm. Stefan. No, no, it's it's a good point. If if you have ten teams and all everybody shares one QA environment, definitely there needs to be some kind of a test environment management system where you can book it or reserve it. So good point, yet, Leon. Okay, uh, I, I I like I like hearing good point, Leon, and 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 therefore I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it right <laughs> there. So that's the last thing that was said, and then I'll I'll remember it until the next podcast. Maybe that's your style of catchphrase. I think that's a good point to 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 pause. Because next time we can then actually start looking at the actual in sprint activities and, and and what that entails, and then obviously once you get past your sprint, your sprint demos, your your, your retros and, and that type of thing. So I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks a lot, uh, and I'm looking forward to the next one. So thanks to anyone that watched, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. This has been an episode of Testing Experts with Opinions, an inspired testing podcast. Find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, where we're driving conversations.